Life is full of tough stuff. As we've heard it said many times, we can't often control what happens to us, but we must control how we respond to what happens to us. Amen? Well, so far in this series, we have looked at bruised relationships and the unfairnesses of life. And many of us have experienced both bruised relationships and unfairnesses. But I wonder, have you implemented any of the biblical steps we learned from Rick Warren to restore those bruised relationships, to get through those difficult times? So just as a reminder this morning, I want to kind of just give a quick review about getting through bruised relationships. Number one, we said there were, uh, that we needed to talk to God before talking to the person. There are times that when relationships get bruised that, man, we just want to blame shift and we want to accuse and we want to be derogatory towards that person who's hurt our feelings. And, and it may be that God just wants us to pray about it first. Because maybe we don't need to go to the person, maybe we do need to go to the person, but we need to pray first and ask for God's wisdom and direction in the process. Sometimes, number two, we need to take the initiative. Because if we wait for someone else to right or wrong, you might be waiting for a long time. You know, sometimes we're waiting for that person to come. Don't they understand? Don't they get it? Don't they realize what they've done to me? Most of the time they don't. Most of the time they don't care. So in those bruised relationships, maybe it's that God wants us to take the initiative and to deal with the circumstance at hand. Number three, we may, to, we may need to sympathize with their feelings. It may be that they're going through a difficult time, and that's what led to the disagreement and the bruised relationships. Maybe it's that they're going through a physical circumstance that maybe it's overwhelming for them and they just kind of take it out on you, but they didn't mean to. Remember, 1 Corinthians 13 says this, love thinks no evil. So when something happens against me, I'm going to take the position that they didn't do this on purpose. So I need to sympathize with their circumstances. Number four, confess your part of the conflict. Well, I didn't do anything. It's not my fault. It's all them. It could be that you got some part in it. And that's why it's important to go back to number one and pray about it first. And maybe God is wanting to do some things in your life. And it may be that you're guilty of some things too. Maybe you weren't sympathetic. Maybe you weren't understanding of the circumstances and things that were taking place. So maybe that you need to confess your part of the conflict. Number five, attack the problem, not the person. Boy, it's easy to attack the person instead of the problem, isn't it? Because they're guilty of doing X, Y, Z. Number six, cooperate as much as possible. Am I willing to meet in the middle? No, they got to come the whole way. they got to come to where I'm at. Man, that's pride. That's selfishness. That's arrogance. Sometimes we need to cooperate a little bit more to work towards reconciliation. And then number seven, emphasize the reconciliation, not resolution. There's a big difference there, isn't there? So as we looked at getting through the unfairnesses of life last week, we observed how Joseph persevered through one difficult challenge after another. And no doubt many people could justifiably say that what Joseph went through was definitely not fair. But we learned several bedrock principles from Joseph's life. First, number one, he maintained his character in every circumstance. Man, wouldn't that be wonderful that could be said of us? That in every unfair, difficult circumstance that we maintained our character. Number two, he submitted to his authority in every circumstance. Isn't that sometimes not fun to do at work? I mean, your boss who gets paid most because he knows the most tells you what to do. And, oh, wait a minute. Let me rephrase that. No, you don't understand what I'm saying. But he submitted to his authority no matter what. Number three, he believed he was exactly where God wanted him in every circumstance. Remember, we read that in the end of Genesis chapter 50. He says, I am in the place where God wants me. Do you realize that if God wanted to change your entire life, he could do that? We forget that sometimes. He's a sovereign God. He doesn't need to ask permission. He can do whatever he wants with our lives because he's God. For no other reason, right? Five of you believe that. That's good. He's a sovereign God who can do whatever he wants with our lives. And, jo and Joseph believed that he says, I'm right where God wants me. And we learned four things about that. He didn't get mad or bitter. He didn't retaliate. He didn't speak harshly against those who caused his circumstances. How easy would that be to do? I mean, so-and-so did this, and I'm just, I want to I tell everybody what they've done. 
And he didn't try to get even. Remember the old phrase we used to say as teenagers, I don't get even, I get ahead. You know, I remember a couple of times trying to do that. It didn't work out very well. I had a guy who got me in the lake once as a camper. Well, I woke up at five in the morning and got him wet. Well, then he woke me up out of my sleep with a five-gallon bucket of ice water that he had put in the freezer the night before and poured it over my head. I didn't get even or ahead. He got ahead. <laughs> well, as we get in today's message, I want us to consider getting through the tough stuff of fractured health. Fractured health. All of us have either experienced fractured health or we know someone going through fractured health. And whether it's you or someone you know going through the fractured health, it's often difficult to handle, isn't it? We don't like those circumstances. We wouldn't choose them. We wouldn't pick them if we had to. If we were given an either or, we would say neither one. But as I was preparing for this message, several thoughts kept permeating my mind. First of all, I'm not a doctor. You all know that. So I can't speak from a professional perspective, but I can absolutely speak from an experiential perspective. And secondly, when I refer to fractured health today, I'm not necessarily speaking from a perspective of colds and temporary flus. And so if I could just for a moment, let me explain the difference. There are temporary things that we go through that we once again wouldn't choose, but as we know it, they're temporary. A common cold, a flu, it comes, it irritates us, but it goes away. Uh, a sprained ankle. We don't enjoy those things. I remember, <laughs> I remember I was at a concert in high school. I had a cast on one foot. And I was, I was hopping down the stadium stairs. I twisted my other ankle. I sat there and I could see white and blue stars like I've never seen before or since. And my ankle that was good was now... And I remember thinking to myself, what am I doing here? This is not good. But I had to do it the quick way and not use the crutches. Because, you know, hopping's faster than crutches. It was not fun. But it got better. A cut in your finger. It's irritating, but it heals. A backache. Some of you say, I got one going on right now. A broken arm. You see, in so many things of life, you can put a cast, you can put a band-aid, you can take a pill, and it gets better. And then there are things that are just simply annoying. Some of you, as you've gotten older, you've realized that there's a loss of memory or forgetfulness that comes into your life. And you realize that if you don't write it down, it's not going to happen. It's just reality. It's annoying, but it's reality. Sometimes there's a loss of strength and energy. You can't do what you used to do. And that's kind of annoying sometimes. I remember the day I could lift 400 pounds. I can't do that anymore. Uh, you know, there's just certain things you can't do once you start getting older. Or maybe for some of you, it's that loss of physical movement. You used to be able to move your arms in every which direction and bend over in every which direction, and, and now you just can't. It's like, okay, where's the grabber? i got to find that thing. Because <laughs> you just can't move like you used to. But what we're really referring to this morning is not just those things that are temporary, not just those things that are annoying, but the things that are not temporary, the things that are chronic. Let me give you kind of a list of these things. A various type of cancer, and it changes your life. It changes everything. It changes your schedule. It changes when you wake up, when you go to bed. It changes what you eat and what you like and what you don't like how you feel and don't feel, and all the treatments. And you sometimes wonder, are the treatments beneficial or are they not? Maybe it's a debilitating disease like multiple sclerosis or muscular dystrophy or cerebral palsy or Parkinson's disease. And, and these diseases that attack your nervous system and your, and your cells at the, at the deepest levels, and, and, they, and they attack and they make you weaker and they just distract and frustrate beyond measure but it doesn't go away and it doesn't get better every day they come back for some people it's diseases like schizophrenia or alzheimer's or dementia and you say man these things are terrible and they are but it's a reality either to you or someone you know and you're close to them um 
a disease such as Crohn's disease or diabetes or arthritis, and it just cripples you. How do you get through that? I was even thinking of things like long-term health issues stemming from accidents of some sorts. Such a broken back. It leaves you handicapped in a wheelchair. An amputation. Maybe it's a mental or emotional condition such as bipolar disorder, anxiety, depression, an addiction of some sort. And it's there every day. You know, when it's a cold, you take some flu medicine. When it's a sprained ankle, you get an ace wrap and you wrap it up. Put some ice on it. Feels better. When it's a cut, you put a band-aid on it. You get a stitch. When it's a broken arm, you get a cast. How do you put a band-aid on your mind? How do you put a cast on anxiousness or depression? How do you put a stitch in schizophrenia or bipolar disorder? Many of you maybe grew up like I grew up, that if you have any one of these kinds of issues, you just read the Bible more, spend more time in prayer, and it all get better. Anybody familiar with that kind of advice? And it doesn't quite work that way. How do you get through that? As I said before, my perspective is not a professional one. I don't, I'm not that smart. Mine is more experiential. My dad had 16 back operations. He had a toe amputation, led to a foot amputation, led to a lower leg amputation. He had five bypass heart surgery. He had, man, my dad went through, I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there that went through a lot of stuff. But I don't know anybody personally that went through as much stuff as my dad did. My dad spent 25 years of my life in the hospital. And if you remember back in the 70s when you had a back surgery, you were in traction for two, four, six, eight weeks, three months. It wasn't the common thing to have surgery and get them up walking. It was in traction for months. And when my dad passed away, the night he passed away at Unity Hospital, the nurse came over and says, I guess this ends a 25-year relation, relationship with your dad. And I jokingly said, yeah. I says, I guess her building's going to stop for a while. I think my dad's insurance covered the whole third floor of Unity Hospital for 25 years. But that is reality. I experienced that day in and day out. My mornings were getting up, going to the hospital before school started, swinging by the hospital after school was out, going home, doing homework, doing whatever, eating supper, and then mom would run us back up there before bedtime to say goodnight to dad and go back home. I hated it. That was my reality. And if it wasn't enough... I was blessed with diabetes. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that for 20 years it did not bother me. I watched my dad joke around with all the, you know, the insulin and the needles. And he'd kind of take a needle and throw it in his arm and says, look at that steel. You know, it won't even go in there very good. You know, he joked about it, made light of it. But I'm just telling you, 20 years of injections and pricking your fingers and everything else, it just gets old. I, I said about a year ago, I said, I'm just done with this. But the problem is, you can't be done with it. Because it's the reality that God has allowed you to go through. I hate it. I hate medical problems. I hate doctors. It is what it is. No, I shouldn't say I hate doctors. I hate the idea of them practicing medicine. Because they're really not sure what the exact answer is. I've lived with friends who had close friends with people who have gone through various cancers. And it's changed the way they live, the way they wake up. And there really is two perspectives of all this. And for most people, it's the reality of, man, this, fill in the blank, stinks. I would never choose this. Of course you wouldn't. Nobody would. You'd have to be mentally not right to choose a debilitating illness of some sort. Although there are people out there that do that. I wouldn't choose it. You say, well, it really stinks. It, it controls and dominates my mind. It affects my attitude. It steals my joy. That's one perspective. Or we can have the second perspective, which is this circumstance, this health issue, 
is something that God has allowed for a greater purpose, and I don't know what it may be, but he has the freedom to allow it. So how do we handle these things? How do we get through these tough stuff? This tough stuff of fractured health. And let me just say this going forward. This is from my own experience and what I've had to deal with. Both with my dad and myself. Friends that I know that have gone through difficult health issues. Let me just give you about five, six verses that will help us. Number one. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 26.3. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it says, You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. So that's just a tiny little verse. Yes, that's where it starts. Where is your mind in all this? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if I have the mindset that this really stinks and I hate it, it's going to destroy your life. It will, regardless of what it is. Whether it's a mental disorder, whether it's a cancer, or whether no matter what it is, if you have the mindset that it stinks and that you're going to let it rob your joy and steal your, your uh, uh, life away from you, that's exactly what it will do. And it's such a simple thing, but it says you will keep the mind that is dependent on you. We have to realize that we cannot do anything else but depend on God to get through it. It's amazing how often doctors will say, let's try this, and let's try this, and let's try this, and, and none of it works. Why? Because man doesn't have the answer to everything. And the only way to have peace, and he doesn't just say peace, he says perfect peace, is to keep your mind on him. You see, do we believe in the power of God or not? Yes or no? If I were to say to you, is there anything God cannot do? No, of course. God's powerful. He's mighty. He can do anything He chooses to do. God is not limited by man's ability or man's thoughts or anything else. God is so powerful, He can do whatever He wants. So if God didn't want you to have cancer, He could have said, you know what, I'm not going to let that person go through it. If God didn't want you to have that mental disorder, He'd say, I didn't want you to go through it. I'm not going to let that affect you. Do we believe that? So if God has allowed it, He must have a reason for it. And He says, wait a minute. First of all, you can have peace through this. It doesn't have to steal your life away. So number one, we learn to keep our minds on God by trusting Him. We learn to keep our mind on Him by trusting in Him. This is not a mistake. It didn't happen by coincidence. He allowed it for a reason. Regardless of what it is. And I can have peace through it if I keep my mind on Him. And that's a daily thing. It's not a one-time thing. There are many times as I've woken up with diabetes and I hate it. And I say, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Guess what? Got to get my mind back where it needs to be. Because it's the reality of the life that I have. I'll give you a second one. Proverbs 18, 15. The mind of the discerning acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks it. Here's number two. Learn what you can so you can manage what you have. Don't be ignorant about it. You're going to trust God through it. You're going to keep your mind on Him. You're going to find your strength through Him. But learn what you can about it so that you can manage it the best way you can. My wife and my kids tease me. I was reading a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell this story. They're going to be embarrassed. I'm going to laugh. You're going to laugh, but I'm going to tell this story. I was reading about diabetes. And I'm on the internet surfing the eight bazillion pages and I'm about done just kind of finding if there's any new breakthroughs, any new things to do this, do that. <laughs> and I finally get one little article that says yoga. Now picture Big Pastor Ken and yoga. <laughs> Whatever. And this, so, so I'm sitting there, so I click on this link, and it has like all these different, if you just stretch, these stretching exercises. And I'm sitting there looking at all these things, and, <laughs> and I'm like, one link, and as soon as I hit this link, another thousand pages opened up, which is yoga linked to diabetes and thyroid disorder. So I'm like following all these things, and finally I read this big article, it's really interesting. And it says, you can buy my book, 99 cents on Amazon. Clicking off Google, buying the Amazon book on yogic experience. 
And I got to read this. So I get this yoga thing in the mail, this book on yoga. And I tease my kids, I'm going to start going to do yoga. And my kids are like, what? No, Dad, don't do this. Don't do this. You can't do this. I haven't done it. But every chance I get, I rub it in. I go. You know, I do all these little, I don't even know if there are moves in yoga. I have no clue. We search for answers, don't we? Any of you that's ever gone through a cancer, what do you do? Google it. Bing it. Yahoo it. Something. Because we want the inside scoop on what it's going to take to get through it. And then you have the question, who am I going to believe? Who am I going to trust? This thing, that thing, this doctor, that doctor. It's okay to be wise. In fact, that's what Proverbs says. The mind of the discerning acquires knowledge. And the ear of the wise seeks it. But we do that. We learn what we can so we can manage what we have. It's okay to be wise. But understand our doctor is the Lord. Our healer is the Lord. Let me give you a third one. John chapter 9. Very familiar passage. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I don't have time to. But I want to read a couple of verses from it. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. It says, As he was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I mean, isn't there just an assumption here that somebody did something wrong, and that's why he's blind? Period. No questions asked. Done. End of the story. But it's not the end of the story. It says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. You know why that you're going through the struggle that you're going through or your friend is going through the struggle that they're going through? It's so that God can be glorified. We forget that. We forget that in every malady, God is trying to do something through it. We just want to get through it and pretend it never happened or just want to pretend it's not there. We just want to deal with it and just not have to deal with it. And then God has a reason for it. So that he would be glorified. So the works of God might be on display. Who gets the glory when you live with something for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? God does. Where do you find the strength? And when you share how you get through things, God does. He gets glory for it. But he doesn't stop there. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, We know that all things work together for good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. What is it that God's trying to do in your life through that circumstance, that difficult health issue? I believe it's that he's trying to mold you more into the likeness of his son. He says, verse 28, and there's a condition here. We don't always look at the conditional part of verse 28. It says, we, all, we know that all things work together for good for who? For anybody and everybody? No. To those that love God. Do I love God enough to trust him? That he knows what he's doing with my life. Guess what? God's been around for thousands of years and he's yet to make his first mistake. I've humorously said many times over the years, God did not wake up this morning and scratch his head and say, wow, I didn't know that was going to happen. He knows. And he doesn't make any mistakes. So if he's allowed it, number three, we have to learn the purpose of our fractured health. Is that he can mold us more into the image of his son and that he might be glorified through it. You know why God allows things? So that he'd be glorified. You know why God allows troubles, difficult times, so that we'd be more like his son. So I don't really want the health issue. I really don't want the, the situation in my life. Well, <laughs> until you learn what God's purpose is, you're probably going to have to keep dealing with it. Over and over and over again. For years upon years, possibly. There's a third one, or fourth one. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 
But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore I will most gladly boast in more, all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. I think number four, we need to learn that God's grace is sufficient. I can deal with this. I can. You know, in life it's really easy to see what doesn't work, isn't it? When something's not right, it's just glaringly obvious, isn't it? But when something's working right, it doesn't stand out as much. When my weaknesses are turned into opportunities for God to work, that's when we realize that His grace is sufficient. I can get through this. And even though I know it doesn't work right, and other people may see it, I know that God is at work. I know that He's at work. And I think there's a fifth thing that will help us through these difficult, fractured health issues. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. If you would turn your Bibles there. A couple good verses to underline here. Ecclesiastes. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. It says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie to, down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. I think the fifth thing we need to do is learn to lean on God and good friends. You know what hinders so many people that have fractured health? Pride. I don't want anyone to know that I'm going through this difficult time. Because the culture that we live in says everything has to be just perfect on the outside. That's why we come into church every week and say, Hey, how's it going? And the great pat answer is, Fine, awesome, wonderful, life is good. And if we all had a nickel for every time we were lied to, we'd all be rich. Because life isn't always fine, great, grand, perfect, okie dokie. But what hinders us is pride. I don't want anyone to know that I'm struggling in my mind. I mean, that's a taboo. I mean, to find out, you, if someone finds out I have bipolar or dementia, or I'm starting to lose my memory, or if somebody finds out that, you know, I'm on medication for these things, oh, I, I can't deal with that. It's pride. It's pride. I know who I am in God. Do you? I'm perfectly and wonderfully made. In the image of his son, by the way, in case you've forgotten. By the way, I'm going to be skinny in heaven, just so you know. You might not recognize me. But you know what? God made us and designed us with his son in mind. And he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He made no mistakes with you or your mind or your heart, or your lungs, or this illness or that illness. It's not by chance. It's not by accident. And there's times that the scripture tells us two are better than one. One down, the other one can pick them up. Can I just encourage you to find a friend that you can lean on? Because a friend can encourage you like no one else. We forget that. You need to learn on learn. I have learned in the last several years, especially, that there are other people who are going through the very same things that I'm going through. It might seem like you're all alone, but you're not. You're not the only one on medication for your mind. You're not the only one wearing an insulin pump. You're not the only one that has to go to the doctor monthly for blood work. In fact, they remind me that the older I get, the more my social calendar is going to fill up with doctor's appointments. It might happen. There might be a day that you have to do some things that are not pleasant because someone's going through fractured health. I never thought I'd see the day where I'd have to help my dad go to the bathroom and, and wipe him. That's not fun. You never thought you'd see the day where someone that you loved and cared for passed away in your arms. It's not fun. But did God make a mistake? No. 
Are we going to live forever? Not on this earth. I tell people all the time, if God tarries and we live long enough and his son doesn't come for us, we're all going to experience all kinds of things that are not enjoyable. That's the reality of this life that we live in. And I can have the perspective that it really just stinks and let it rob me of my joy and my, my happiness or I can say, God, you're in control of this. Well, how can you help others going through fractured health? First of all, be that friend that we talk about in Ecclesiastes 4. Be that friend. Be willing to listen. Be willing to help. We live in such a rat race world today that we have a calendar full of, all, full of all kinds of things that we have to get done that we don't take time to ask someone else, do you have any needs? Can I bring you a meal? Can I mow your yard for you? Can I pick up some groceries for you? Oh, we mean well. And we're sincere about it. But we're busy. Take time. To help others who are going through fractured health. I see the greatest example of this in Luke chapter 10, verse 34. Though it's only a temporary thing, I believe. Talking about the Good Samaritan. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. He went out of his way. And just tell me, um, when's the last time we reached out to somebody who had a legitimate need that just, they're struggling? <coughs> Recently, I bought a CD from Brian Free and Assurance, and there's a song called The Extra Mile. Are we willing to go the extra mile in a one-mile world? Because he says, compassion, forget the phrase, compassion and reaching out never come at good times, so to speak. Is it ever convenient? Really? Is it? Is it ever really convenient to help somebody struggling? I mean, who's not busy? Who doesn't have a job? Who doesn't have a family that they're caring for? Or responsibilities? Is it ever convenient? Truthfully, not really. But are you willing to do it? And then there's a second one in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If you can get through it, whatever the it is, Comfort someone else in the same way you've been comforted. Be there to help others in need. I know that I can't go through life by myself with the struggles that I have. And my wife is like, yeah, I know you can't do it. <laughs> what a blessing to have people in your life that care for you and encourage you and comfort you. I could just remind ourselves in conclusion here to learn what God wants you to learn through your fractured health. Number one, learn to keep your mind on God by trusting Him. That's where it starts. I can remember the day that I had the first symptoms of diabetes. I was out leading the congregational singing in a church of 300, and I could not see anybody beyond the second row. It was just a blur. And uh, one of my deacons comes out and says, Hey, Ken, what's going on? I said, I don't know. And he goes out and gets a doctor who is in our congregation. He comes out. He says, what's going on? I said, I don't know. Ask Bob. He went and got you. I'm fine. I wasn't fine. Went to the doctor the next day. Even after the next day, my sugars were in the high 500s. Changes your life. Almost immediately. 
But there's that first sense of fear. Oh no. Right, Don? What am I going to do? God knew that day would come. Do I trust him or not? So learn to keep your mind on God by trusting him. Number two, learn what you can so you can manage what you have. So those of you that want to constantly bring me sugars and pies, stop. I know I'm the preacher and I love peach pie, but make sure it's sugar-free if you're going to do it. Learn what you can so you can manage what you have. Take the time to learn. Because there are things that complicate your illnesses and things that help them. It's called common sense. Number three, learn the purpose of your fractured health. That God is doing a work through you and he's going to glorify himself because of it. We've got to come to that conclusion. God has not made a mistake. Though I hate it, he's in charge. Number four, learn that God's grace is sufficient. He'll get you through it. Always. He'll get you through it. It may not be in your timing and in the way that you would have chosen, but he'll get you through it. And number five, learn to lean on God and good friends. And secondly, not only learn what God wants you to learn, but when possible, help others with a fractured health. I think every one of us, if I were to ask this question out loud, how many of you are either going through something that's chronic and non-temporary and ongoing or have a close friend that all of us could raise our hands? What does God want you to do in response to that? He has the answers. Am I willing to implement them? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be here. And Lord, to learn what it means to go through fractured health. To realize that you do have a purpose, you have a plan, you made no mistakes. And I thank you, God, for giving us your word to direct us, to guide us in these difficult circumstances. And I ask, God, that you would do what only you can do to help us understand your will, your plan. So, God, speak to our hearts, we pray. Maybe you're here this morning. You say, Pastor, uh, I understand what you're going through. You say, Pastor, uh, I'm going through some of those things myself. Got something that drives me nuts, that frustrates me, that kind of distracts me from being or doing what God has for me in my life. Or I have close friends that are going through those things. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I needed that this morning.